my name is Carolyn Van Dyken, and I'm going to be speaking to you over the next 25 minutes or so on low back pain and pelvic floor dysfunction and their connection. Um, and I'm going to entitle this uh, talk Sibling Rivalry. So let's dig in and find out why I gave it this title. I have no um, conflict of interest to declare. I would love to acknowledge uh, Sue Croft and the organization committee for inviting me to speak and I thank them very much for this kind invitation. Rosa has been so helpful in coordinating all the administrative functions. And there are three colleagues of mine in Australia that I would like to acknowledge, Sean Morrison, Dr. Trish Newman and Dr. Judith Thompson, who have all been um, keen to really um, incorporate a biopsychosocial framework into their practice and to really spread the word in Australia. And so I've been working um, closely with them and have really enjoyed that relationship. So I'm a, a Canadian, I'm a physiotherapist, I'm a clinician predominantly. I educate um, through Reframe Rehab. I do some, I teach some classes. I um, do some research with Dr. Sinead Dufour and I'm, you're gonna see some of that research presented in this particular talk. I predominantly though uh, would, would identify as a clinician and I have a musculoskeletal background as well as a pelvic health background as well as a pain science background. So I think where I bring um, some unique differences to this field is how I combine those three areas that over the last 33 years I've been able to um, hone my skills in. Um, again, here's some research papers that I've done, as well as some books that I've co-authored, and you can take a look at those if you're interesting, interested in that. So why are we talking about sibling rivalry here? So certainly when we look at the connection between low back pain and pelvic floor dysfunction, I'm going to make the argument that they are siblings, that they grow up in the same family and they have a lot in common. However, if we look at Wolfson... Wolfson's definition of rivalry or sibling rivalry, he highlights, and he's a psychologist, that highlights a couple of characteristics of sibling rivalry. And, and we can see this happening in musk and pelvic health specifically. So I think often um, as women's health physiotherapists and musk therapists, we haven't been taught to value each other. We haven't been really taught to see the connection between our work. We often struggle as well that we feel that we don't necessarily have enough personal space, right? And, and particularly pelvic floor, I would say, has been a forgotten component of musk therapy. And so we really need to, to go back and take a look at that piece more specifically. And we could argue that, at least historically, one gets more funding than the other. When we look at clinical practice guidelines and, and um different uh, professional scenarios that happen around musculoskeletal low back pain, there's a lot more funding in that pool than there has been in pelvic health specifically. So when we look at low back pain, my first question is, is it always the low back that's the problem? And so let's look at some empirical evidence that really over the last 15 years has shown that there is actually a very strong correlation between musculoskeletal health low back pain specifically, and pelvic health. And um, the first study that I'd like to talk about is Michelle Smith's study in 2006. This, of course, is an Australian study that showed very clearly that the two strongest comorbidities for developing low back pain were pelvic floor dysfunction and respiratory dysfunction. A Lyson study in 2008 showed that with 200 women, 78% of women who presented to a clinic with low back pain actually also had comorbid pelvic floor dysfunction. And Ben Wingerden um, didn't publish this data, but presented at the first World Congress of Abdominal Pelvic Pain in Amsterdam, showed that in a large group of patients, there was a predominant um, combination of pelvic girdle pain and pelvic floor dysfunction, so 63% of women 57% of women had combined low back pain, pelvic girdle pain, and pelvic floor dysfunction, and one third of men. So we can't ignore men in this conversation, although for the rest of this talk, I am going to be focusing on women. So despite this empirical evidence, this has not actually trickled down or translated into low back pain guidelines. So if we look at the guidelines that have been developed over the last decade or so with regards to clinical practice guidelines for low back pain, we do not see the mention of pelvic floor problems or dysfunction or disorders in those guidelines. 
So the question that we first had, so Dr. Sinead Dufour, who is a researcher and clinician at McMaster University in Hamilton, and myself um, and two other clinicians, Brittany Van Dyke and my daughter actually, Marie-José Marie Forget, looked specifically at answering the question, what is the prevalence and type of pelvic floor dysfunction among women with lumbopelvic pain? So what we did was we recruited 182 women at five different sites into the study. And there was a large exclusion rate. Now the exclusions were for pain catastrophizing greater than 30, refusal to have an internal exam, narcotic, narcotic usage, and English as a second language. By far the largest reason for exclusion was pain catastrophizing greater than 30. Now if you know anything about the PCS scale, greater than 30 is severe catastrophization. So it's really interesting that these women who presented to an orthopedic practice for low back pain, the great majority of them, so more people were excluded than included, actually had significant catastrophization. And yet most of us don't measure catastrophization on a regular basis in our practice. The average age of the women in our study was 41.6 years old. And what we found was that of these women who presented with just low back pain, that's why they came to the practice, 95.3% of them self-reported pelvic floor disorders, at least one of them, at least one disorder. So what was unique about this study, because again, Eliason had done a similar study and Michelle Smith and, and uh, Ben Wingerden, we actually then went on to do um, a double blind exam. So there was a blinded musculoskeletal therapist that did a series of musculoskeletal tests and identified pelvic girdle pain or mechanical low back pain if it was present. And then there was another blinded physiotherapist who then did an internal examination. And on internal examination, what we found the most predominant characteristic of the pelvic floor problems was an overactive pelvic floor or tenderness on palpation. So 71% of the participants had tenderness on palpation of the pelvic floor. Two thirds were weak and 41% had a prolapse specifically. So when we look at those um, outcomes, one of the things that we wanna start thinking about is historically the role of physiotherapists in chronic low back pain has often been a role of core strengthening. And yet if what we see in the pelvic floor is predominant sort of overactivity, how does the role of core strengthening really fit into a system that is already under tension? So that was one of our first findings. We also found that the overactive pelvic floor, so with tenderness on palpation is how we determined overactivity, that that was more strongly associated with disability compared to pelvic floor weakness. So that was interesting as well. Now, what we know is that in most societies throughout the world, siblings often grow up together and that's how they develop the strong emotional bonds that often happen between siblings. But my question is, is that true for low back pain and pelvic floor dysfunction? I would say across the world that most therapists would either identify as a musculoskeletal therapist or as a pelvic health therapist, but there are very few that um, really assess and treat both. So then our next project was, if there's such a strong correlation between low back pain and pelvic floor disorders, can we help musk therapists actually identify pelvic floor disorders, number one? And number two is, based on the type of disorder they have, can we actually help them predict, are they, is the patient likely to have an overactive pelvic floor or a weak pelvic floor? or a lack of coordination perhaps leading to prolapse, for example. Okay, so we were looking at sort of self-report and physical findings. So again, we, we set up the study in a very similar way to the last study. This time, however, we had created a questionnaire and the questionnaire is there on your left. And we were looking for some specific types of issues with regards to pelvic floor disorders. So frequency, um, hesitation, uh, we looked at urinary urgency, we looked at leakage, we looked at pain during or after a bowel movement, constipation, dyspareunia or painful intercourse, general pelvic pain in the pelvic region around the either sex organs or sort of um, pubic symphysis, groin area specifically, and then we looked for dysmenorrhea in women. 
So what we found was that there was actually a 100% correlation between, and again, this was a, a double blind study. So when the patient reported a pelvic floor disorder, there was a 100% correlation with the physiotherapist then identifying some level of pelvic floor dysfunction. However, there was not a strong correlation between identifying um, overactivity and certain conditions. So we couldn't actually correlate weakness with, let's say, incontinence. Now, if you look at our incontinence question, the problem is we actually combined urge incontinence and stress incontinence into that question. And so we weren't able to actually ascertain if they were incontinent, were they overactive, were they weak, or did they lack coordination? There was no correlation between that. So this was actually a negative study. And despite this being a negative study, physical therapy published it in 2019. What we were actually able to show was that two factors independently predicted pelvic floor muscle tenderness on palpation or overactivity. And that was very strong or uncontrollable urinary urgency, urges, sorry, and central sensitization scores of greater than 40. So those two characteristics were correlated with tenderness on palpation, which is interpreted as an overactive pelvic floor. Now the limitations of the study is that um, we actually used patients who uh, were reporting again to an orthopedic practice with uh, low back pain. We also though used um, physiotherapists who were coming to a public health class who reported having low back pain and or hip pain in the last week. So some of the, the patients in this or the, the subjects in the study were not seeking care and that will probably impact some of the outcomes. The other thing that we need to acknowledge is that the technique for assessing pelvic floor muscle tenderness on palpation does require further validation. Um, Cynthia Neville was one of the first uh, researchers back in 2012 that looked at using tenderness on palpation as identification of women in a double blind study who had chronic pelvic pain. We correlate it with overactivity. However, that's not, we don't have um, a really good objective way of measuring that at this point. But I did a study, uh, a, a um, pilot study in 2015, I believe, that also started to look at tenderness on palpation as an identification factor of um, uh, overactivity in the pelvic floor. So we need some more work on that, um, or validation work on that specific area. So that second study, unfortunately, we can use a questionnaire to identify whether someone has a pelvic floor disorder. The questionnaire does not help us identify then what type of pelvic floor disorder the patient has. We took that same uh, data from the second study, and we then looked at was there convergent validity between pelvic floor muscle, muscle tenderness on palpation and central sensitization scores of greater than 40 on part A. We also wanted to know was there correlation or convergent validity between tenderness on palpation and the different pelvic floor disorders. And the outcome of the study, this third study, which was just published in the Brazilian Journal of Physical Therapy this year, showed that in fact there was convergent validity, which just means that the two things are actually correlated. And the two things that are correlated are tenderness on palpation and central sensitization. So when we see a patient who has tenderness on palpation, there's, a, there's convergent validity then with central sensitization. And this fits really nicely with um, Jeremy Denonese and Helena Frawley's uh, meta-analysis that was published in 2019 that looks at uh, the fact that uh, there's actually very poor correlation between treating trigger points with manual therapy and um, resolving persistent pain. So again, when we see tenderness on palpation of the pelvic floor, what we have to think about is just this bigger picture of why is the pelvic floor being overprotective? Why is it guarding? Why is it in that state? 
And I, again, would look upstream, I would look at the central nervous system. We know from Vanderveld study in 2001, that if you show women very frightening film, and you put muscle sensors over her body, before she blinks or moves away, she tightens her pelvic floor. So we're hardwired to protect our pelvises. And that makes sense from a procreation perspective, um, sexual function, bladder function, bowel function, we could argue that everything that's important in the world happens in our pelvis. So it shouldn't surprise us that when we see tenderness on palpation that it is highly correlated to central sensitization and that we then need to look at that tenderness from a broader biopsychosocial framework. This also fits with where the research has been taking us with low back pain. So this series that was written by Mary O'Keefe and um, Stephen George, Peter O'Sullivan, Kieran O'Sullivan, is a series of three papers published in Lancet in 2017 that makes the argument that we need to move away as physiotherapists from our biomedical, or biomechanical view of chronic low back pain and take a much more broad biopsychosocial perspective. That tension and central sensitization have much more to do with idiopathic low back pain than biomechanics. So, what we do know at this point is not only are pelvic floor dysfunction and low back pain siblings, but they actually have a lot in common. So hopefully the rivalry we can drop and what they have in common and what we can start to attend to in both conditions is central sensitization. So what does that mean? What does that look like? Well, Joe Nysha's work in Belgium, I'm really a big fan of the work that he and his team are doing. He says if central sensitization is present, it predicts poor outcomes following classical local treatments, such as electrotherapy, motor control exercises, manual therapy, and surgery. And what needs to be done for treating people with central sensitization is to really look at lifestyle factors that sustain the process of a sensitive nervous system, including our beliefs, our thoughts, stress, sleep, physical inactivity, and diet. So when we look at pelvic floor dysfunction and low back pain, what do we need to do? Well, the first thing we need to do is to sit back and take a really thorough history. Central pain mechanisms and central sensitization, so much information is gathered in the patient's story. We develop a strong therapeutic alliance when we sit back and really listen to the history and really make sure that our patient's story is heard. The second thing we need to do is we need to use questionnaires to objectively identify or profile their sensitive nervous system. So again, we can desensitize their nervous system um, and then get them moving functionally again. So that's number one. We have to consider the, the central nervous system from the beginning. The second thing is, is we need to rule in or rule out mechanical low back pain. Now, Audrey Long did a nice study in spine in 2004 that showed that acute, subacute, and chronic low back pain, about 74% of patients have a mechanical component. And that just means that they have a directional preference. They like to move in a specific way, which quickly reduces their pain. Her research studies showed that if you treat them in the direction of their um, directional preference, that 92% of them will resolve their pain in two weeks. And if you go in their opposite direct, um, movement direction to their directional preference, only 24% will resolve in two weeks. So ruling in or ruling out the spine is always a really important component. I'm going to talk in a few minutes as well about the connection that is starting to be developed. And I have observed in my clinical practice over the last two decades as a McKenzie credential therapist, the connection between mechanical low back pain and lower urinary tract symptoms. The last piece in all patients is we also need to consider the contributions of the pelvic floor. Let's not pathologize the pelvic floor. The most common thing we see in the pelvic floor is overactivity. And so that is very tension based. That is highly correlated to central sensitization and the need to protect. So we don't need to make it a pathological problem, but we need to consider what's happening in the pelvic floor. We need to learn how to assess it externally if you do not have internal palpatory skills and you need to develop a referral relationship with an internal pelvic floor therapist to treat low back pain.
So here is a case series done by uh, Woody, Dai Wu is his name, he's an orthopedic surgeon who came to Canada about 10 or 15 years ago I believe, and while he was waiting to write his qualifying exams to become an orthopedic surgeon in Canada, he went back and became a physical therapist, physiotherapist at McGill University. One of the first courses he took after graduating um, from physiotherapy was a McKenzie course, and after becoming a McKenzie credential therapist, he actually chose not to pursue returning to orthopedic surgery because he was so um, thrilled with the results that he was getting. He's also a pelvic floor physiotherapist. So again, he has a very diverse but connected practice. What he did in this particular case series is he took three men who presented to his practice with lower urinary tract symptoms. They did not present with low back pain. So the opposite um, of what we did in our study. And what he did was he assessed them mechanically. And what he was able to show was within five visits, he was able to reduce their symptoms, their lower urinary tract symptoms, include, including overactive bladder, urinary urgency, frequency, stress incontinence, um, and testicular pain. Um, I believe pain with intercourse was also part of um, the presentation of some of the men that he was looking at. And again, it's a case series. It's only three individuals. So again, we have to look at the level of evidence, but it's interesting to start to put this connection together. He found that 56 to 75% of their symptoms reduced, their lower urinary tract symptoms reduced in five visits. The similar uh, case studies was published uh, last year by Christine Hughes and Stephen May. This time they took seven women and one male patient, same thing, presenting with lower urinary tract symptoms, treated them mechanically by assessing and treating a directional preference in the spine, and were able to reduce um, about 60 to 75 percent of their symptoms. So again, it's not all about the spine. We have to consider the pelvic floor contributing factors. We have to consider the central nervous system components. We really have to marry central sensitization, pelvic floor issues, and low back pain presentation. So my question to you is, do you have a regular routine for screening low back pain and pelvic floor dysfunction? And this is a two-way street. As pelvic health uh, therapists, you need to start considering the low back mechanically. Do you know how to do a good mechanical screen? Orthopedic therapists, you need to start screening the pelvic floor, maybe using the um, questionnaire that we developed and published in physical therapy because there was a 100% um, correlation between the patient reporting on that questionnaire a pelvic floor problem and identifying a pelvic floor problem on physical exam in a blinded study. What I'd like you to, to really take away from this talk is that low back pain and pelvic floor dysfunction need to be considered in tandem. We can no longer consider them as separate entities. Pelvic health therapists may need to develop strong skills in mechanical diagnosis and therapy. Orthopedic therapists may need to understand the role of pelvic floor dysfunction and develop palpation skills or a close referral relationship with a pelvic health physiotherapist. And we all need to develop a psychologically informed practice. I'm going to refer you to a talk that you can find on YouTube by Dr. David Nichols, a professor in New Zealand, who talks about the end of physiotherapy. And he talks about the end of physiotherapy in the context of we need to move away from viewing the body as a machine in physiotherapy, where for the last 100 years, that, has, that is where we have come from. But if we are going to succeed and continue to move in a positive way as a profession, we need to leave, leave that framework behind and use a biopsychosocial framework in order to move our profession forward. Thank you very much. And I hope that you enjoyed that and started to challenge some of your thoughts and beliefs about the connections between low back pain and pelvic floor dysfunction.